e poi ancora Bonaventura, l'Inter è stanchissima, Bonaventura dentro per Niang, il tiro fermato, gol forever Yang Niang, impazzisco, forever Yang Niang, impazzisco, forever Yang Niang, impazzisco, forever Yang Niang, impazziamo, 3 a 0. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to you wherever you may be listening to this, what we hope will be the first of many Sempre Milan podcasts. Uh, my name is Oliver Fisher, I'm one of the founders of Sempre Milan, and I'm here with Daniel Gutman. Uh, I'm a uh, senior editor here and a uh, lifelong fan of the club from New York City. And uh, we do apologize for any mishaps that may occur, but we hope to sort that out in the foreseeable episodes so that your listen is as smooth as possible. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time either of us have done anything like this, so we just want to get into it, really, and uh, start talking about some issues. Um, I suppose we better start with a recap of last season, seeing as this is um, between the seasons. Obviously, it was a massively disappointing season yet again, um, where there was little stability, and um, managed to uh, just about pee off every fan, I think. Uh, managing to bottle sixth place as well, losing in the final despite a good performance. Um, it just wasn't good, was it, Dan? Uh, not at all. I mean, you look at our results and we finished seventh, and then it is indeed an improvement on our last two seasons, tenth and eighth place. But, you know, you look back and we're third, second, first. It's still a very unacceptable place to be. Um, I think the fans probably expected a lot more given the investment that we saw in the summer. But, of course, there was the fans who were realistic at the same time who acknowledged that perhaps we'd addressed a couple of needs and obviously the signing of Baca was good and on paper the signing of Bertolacci was good. But, you know, sometimes things just don't work out and then that run towards the end of the season when Mihailovic lost his job was ultimately when it started to unravel for us and we couldn't even get into the Europa League qualification. Uh, yeah, like... Baca was a, and it was an astute purchase because he, in the beginning of the season, he very much carried us, and in our unbeaten run towards the the middle to the second half, uh, he was very good as well, but, I mean, you can look at him, and there are a lot of faults that he had, he disappeared for weeks on end, and Mm -hmm. while he did, he scored 18 goals, uh, yeah, his, that's, that's he was one of not, the things. He was not dynamic. He was a very one-dimensional player. He still is a very one-dimensional player, and that's part of the reason that he started having goal droughts is teams figured him out. They figured out that you shut down the one or two players in Milan who are creative enough to provide for him, and he's, he's lost. He cannot uh, make chances for himself. And the team is then lost as a result because he was our one sort of real finisher um, and he managed to get a bit of a partnership going with Niang that worked I would say really well because Niang did a lot of the dirty work and he was willing to drift out wide and he was willing to create but then you know none of the other strike partners worked and as a lone striker it didn't seem to work so you know what can you do I mean there was a couple of good moments in the season obviously beating into th- 3-0 was amazing. It was amazing to be there in the curve of Sud for that. Um, and reaching a major final was pretty good as well, I suppose. But, you know, we've got to hope for bigger things, haven't we, really? Yeah. Well, I just want to address the uh, the signings a little bit. I mean, we have Romagnoli, who was exceptional and a very he was a very good buy. But then on the flip side, you have Bertolacci, who... We bought for 20 million euros, was it? And yeah. he ended up being worse than uh, Kuka, who we signed for five times less. Yeah, uh, Kuka, has been, Kuka was extremely important. He was doing the dirty defensive work that we had De Jong do for two seasons previously. Uh, I think getting, he, was doing it, he was doing it better as well, really. Uh, it's in, in, in certain ways, he was more willing to, get, to go into... A higher quantity of tackle certainly, but he doesn't yet have the the same presence that De Jong has. Where De Jong didn't even have to go into the tackles because he yeah. is, he's fearsome, and Kuka does not yet have that. But he mm-hmm. 
is very well on his way. He made uh, extremely important tackles, goal-saving situations pretty much. And he showed a little bit going forward as well, to yeah. be honest. Like, he, he's, he's an incredible dribbler, which I didn't see coming, but uh, obviously for, for a defensive midfielder or flat-out central midfielder, like, he, he doesn't have any end product yet, really, but, you know, yeah. it's not his job, so... That's true. Um, it was an encouraging buy, probably the best buy of the summer, would you agree? Yes, I would. He is the one who will bring the most stability to the team. Uh, well, mm-hmm. Romagnoli, obviously, he is more expensive and he hasn't he hasn't paid off the investment yet, but I think Kuka for the 3 or $4 million that we signed him for has already paid off uh, and more what yeah. the team invested into him, and... I also want to, of course, highlight Donnarumma, who was just a, a exceptional the entire season oh, for yeah. a, a teenager who, you know, wasn't even done with his uh, you know, secondary schooling. He was already a, playing extremely well for a professional football club, and that's impressive on its own. But playing he, week in week in week out in an eighty thousand seat stadium, I mean. There's not many 16, 17-year-olds can say that, you know. Yeah. Um, and I can understand why there's a lot of teams after him, but I think he will hang around for a while yet. What do you think was our uh, the worst position, worst, I guess, weakest link uh, throughout the season? Um, I would probably say central midfield, purely because obviously, obviously um, Kutch did well, but... He never really had a consistent partner next to him. Obviously, Montalivo is just absolute gash. Um, and then Bertolacci never found his form. So, really, we were playing with one man in midfield most of the time. So, yeah, I would say that, to be honest. I agree. I think that, I mean, Kuchka was he was playing well. Montalivo had his moments. He wasn't garbage the entire season like I think Bertolacci was. Bertolacci just yeah. made 60% of his passes to nowhere or backwards and the ones that he completed at least. those. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I also want to highlight le- I think that I'm in the minority on this opinion but I believe that left back was a huge issue as well. And I say this because watching our matches analyzing our matches week in and week out so many attacks went down our left flank, and that's because neither yeah. of our left backs are good defensively. Uh, Deshilio has just been a, a liability for a while now. That's a that's not me being biased. That's a consensus among yeah, many fans. I would say that's a, a general view. But even Antonelli, who he was good going forward, I cannot say that he wasn't. But Defensively, he did. He was slow in tracking back. He was not good yeah. at putting down attacks, and he was caught out. I think the worst. And this is a match that, if you listeners, you don't believe me, you can watch again. Uh, the Sassuolo, the two yeah. zero Sassuolo loss. Um, he was at fault for their second goal, and he could have been at fault for three or four more. Because mm-hmm. he he can't keep up with quick-footed players on the defensive aspect, even if he can match them with speed going forward. And another issue, I think, I saw was the fact that the team cannot rally after going behind. Yeah, that we definitely times, saw that. Especially coupled with our slow starts, that if there was a goal scored against us, it was a very small likelihood that there would be some sort of comeback. We might score, but the other team would score as well, and it would not end up with the uh, positive results for our for our side. And that contributed to the poor mental aspect of the team that led to the collapse towards the end of the season where we had a 12-game unbeaten run, I believe. And then after that, it was... It just went downhill yeah. very fast. Yeah. Against, against without being disrespectful, some really, really average sides as well. Like, obviously, Brocky won his first game away at Sampdoria, and really, 
we were lucky to get... We created a lot in that game, but we were still lucky to get the three points. And then, obviously, not beating any of Carpi, uh, Hellas Verona and uh, Frosinone was just, you know... You, uh, I don't know. It, it was just really, really painful to watch. You know, like I said, no disrespect to those teams because they massively upped their game. And for Frosinone to come and score three against us at San Siro was a bit of a joke, but still a good achievement. But like I said, just the inability to to rally from going to go behind um, and to to keep conceding sloppy goals ultimately cost us come the end of the season and I think Sassuolo were more deserving of sixth place than we were. Uh, I agree. Uh, I'd like to move on to the sale of Stefano Shirawi. Uh, yeah. A lot of fans I've seen on Twitter, on other forms of social media, were not happy with the sale, but I would like to illustrate why I think it was, it was good for all parties involved. The first... Uh, aspect I want to say is that he showed that he could not play well, at least at Milan, with big personalities. So when he had his breakout season, when he he and uh, Bazzini essentially carried us yeah. Yeah. throughout yeah. the 2012-2013 uh, season, he was base, he was the big man in the first half of the uh, campaign. He was the one yeah. who was tasked with scoring every week. And Balotelli came and it kind of went downhill. He was not able to cope with the dynamic of having a very in-your-face striker. That yeah, different work rates as well, I think. Different styles of play, but he didn't really adapt that well in that season. Indeed, and he was played as by Roma as a forward, meaning he would most likely come back and he would intend to play with us as a forward, but... Up front, at striker, uh, we have plenty of options, so there was no guarantee that he would even start there, especially with the chemistry that uh, Niang and Baca showed throughout last season, especially if Baca stayed, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is good for him because he can continue development at Roma where he showed that he could succeed. And yeah, I mean, he, he, at the end of the day, he scored eight goals in 16 appearances for them which I think is pretty good he showed signs of going back to the form that he got in 12-13 when I think he's got 16 goals in the league um, which was a, a, a heck of an effort really um, but obviously he, he did go to Monaco as well um, on loan and I think there was obviously the option to buy on that as well and he just failed massively from what I gather so Roma's a bit of a it's, a, it's like a comfort zone move, but at the same time, I think it will benefit his career. And to be honest, he's not done anything. Um, he's not done anything to offend Milan or anything like that. So I wish him well for the future, really. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm sad that he couldn't reach the heights that he showed glimpses of with uh, mm -hmm. with Milan. But I wish him well with Roma. I would have liked it to not be. A team that is, in a way, uh, a direct competitor, but there's nothing we can do. We got a nice sum of money, uh, which yeah. we saw reinforced, uh, reinvested. I'm sorry, into the purchase of La Padula, which we will get to uh, in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, for all parties involved, it was a a good a good transfer. Yeah, yeah, and um, I I think Roma will um, if if he plays like what we saw in the second half of last season, then Roma have got a good player and they've probably got their money back. You know that they that they paid for him. Um, but from our point of view, like you say, we got a, we got a decent sum of money for a player who hasn't really shown anything for us in the last three years. So so yeah, um, time to sort of sail that ship, I guess, really, and um, wish him the best. Indeed. Uh, let's move on a little bit to the to our transfer market, our incoming transfer market. Uh, who would you say are your ideal targets? Not necessarily names, but the type of player that you think uh, Milan needs the most. Um, I think I think everyone is sort of on the same boat 
with um, with exactly what areas of the squad we need to strengthen. I think looking from the back, um, obviously we don't need a first choice goalkeeper um, because Donnarumma is hopefully going to be that for about fifteen more years. But who knows? Um, we might actually end up needing a backup goalkeeper because Diego Lopez is probably going to leave, and um, obviously Abiati is retired. So then it comes down to is is there anyone who we can bring back from loan or I don't know. Um, but then obviously centre back we we need a centre back to partner Romagnoli. Um, I think the best centre back partnership last season or the one that seemed to work the most effectively was probably Romagnoli and Alex. But um, Alex will be leaving um, upon the expiry of his contract and probably going back to Santos from what I gather. Um, but what we need is a player just like Alex, really, someone who's um, a bit of a veteran but could still give us, you know, four or five years. Um, someone with experience at a high level, uh, but someone who can ultimately play the physical game, uh, who will always be there for the headers in in clutch situations, uh, and also someone who offers a bit of a threat from set pieces as well. I think people don't realise that Alex is actually. Um, did give us a little bit going forward. Um, obviously scored the first goal against Inter, which was just amazing. Um, so yeah, we, we we need another centre back. I would say full back. I would say that we we're okay with um, because we've decided to go and sign another left back in Van Gioni, who we probably didn't need. But Is you know, fourth, fourth left back. I think right now. It's it's a bizarre signing, is that? But yeah. part of me wonders if you know he, he was signed as a bit of a potential left midfielder as well, who could play a little bit further up the pitch. I know he has done that for River Plate, um, but again, is he going to come in and be first choice? Most he probably not. is. I, I don't know. I don't know. It depends what coach comes in and if they like Antonelli or not. Um, I don't know about De Shiglio either. I kind of get the feeling that, based on what we've seen in the media, we we might we might take a, a, a sub, if we got the right offer. I think he would be going, even though obviously <laughs> Brocky and Berlusconi are likely going to be massive fans of his. Um, I think he would probably go for the right offer, um, and then it just comes down on a right back where I guess we've got Abate who. He's probably the most frustrating player um, that that has been around for this long. You know, he he's been on the scene for for so long now, and he still isn't able to string three good games together, um, which is remarkable for a player of his speed and. The player who shown that he does have a bit of an end product in the final third in terms of cro- certainly more than De Shiglio anyway in terms of crossing. Um, but then of course we've got Calabria as well who will hopefully come onto the scene at some point in the near future. Probably not next season, maybe not the season after because he's still young of course. Um, maybe a loan would be good for him or maybe if we promise to play him in cup competitions just anything to aid his development, um, then that would be good. What, what about your thoughts on the back line? Well, I, st- I said my thoughts on the left back as a weak point. I, th- yeah. I hope that Vagnoni is going to somehow help with that, but there's no guarantee that he's going to be starting. It might just be... Also, oh, that's that's how you pronounce it, is it Vagnoni? Uh, I suppose... Uh, just guessing we must. Yeah, because there's, again, there's no guarantee that we're not going to have another season of De Chudio and Antonelli rotating and compromising us defensively. Uh, mm-hmm. I agree with the assessment of the the type of center back Romagnoli needs to partner him because when he, Alec, Alex kept him in line in a way. And when he partnered with Zapata, when he partnered with Mexes to a certain extent, he was more disorganized and lost a bit of the mental edge, especially after he made a mistake, or as with Alex, he 
kept composure more, and Alex, in a way, tutored him. Yeah. Because he was yeah. a senior and a very successful uh, center back. I mm-hmm. don't have any names off the top of my head. Uh, perhaps Moretti from uh, Torino, but they're definitely he yeah. definitely needs to be uh, a veteran. Probably, I would say early thirties, late thirties. I, I think it's not a great idea. Because I would throw a couple of names out there um, who I think could do a good job to partner with Magnolia, who we who we have a realistic chance of, of picking up. I would say Nkolu or Nkalu, however you pronounce it, um, who will be a free agent from what I gather. Um, also was at Marseille and he, he is a physical centre back and probably just fits the mould of what we need. Um, but I would also like to think that if if we were taken over um, then Mustafi would be a realistic player to go and get from Valencia. Um, I know I like him a lot. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. The problem I see with Mustafi is that he isn't in a position to really bring Romagnoli under his wing in a way that mm-hmm. I think Alex did last season and that a 30-something, a early 30s center back would be able to do. Uh, yeah, it but, doesn't have the veteran aspect. Yeah. You who know, knows? Only 20, 24, but... Yeah, who knows? Uh, Romagnoli might have taken more out of the experience with Alex than I give him credit for, and he doesn't need a veteran uh, partner anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, who knows? And for the midfield, it's we need a, a, a dynamic creator. We don't just need a creator. We need somebody who can not only pick their passes out very well, but is also mobile. Uh, mm-hmm. And the the mobility is the problem where Montalivo really fails because he can put together very good passes. It's he, he can't move into space quick enough is, yeah. I think, his issue, and that, unfortunately, at the age that he's in and the type of player that he's been for his entire career, it's not something that's very easily changed, and since he will be needing an upgrade at some point anyway, signing yeah. somebody who can not only be his replacement but also be his upgrade at the same time is, uh, from my point of view, a very logical choice. Yeah. I think um, we're we're all sort of. I think silently hoping that it, it could be Kovacic, but I do have my reservations about that because, you know, first of all, he, he has shown or did show with Inter that he can struggle to play deeper, um, deeper than attacking midfield that is, um, and he does have a bit of a reputation of going missing in games, whereas what we need or what I saw from last season that. That, that we need is a player who is willing to drop uh, and if we're playing out from the back he's willing to drop and say to the centre backs or the full back you know give it to me here um, in a little bit of space turn and then start the attack uh, which is what Montalivo when he's on form does fairly adequately um, but like you say we need we need someone to take us to the next level and we need someone um, who's a long term solution Um I don't know. Have you, have you got any other names to Kovacic? Not, not at the moment. Unfortunately, uh, I think. Well, there are players from the Eredivis that I think could uh, fit Davy Klassen, but he's not in a position to be sold to us and no. or for a price that we can realistically afford. Hakim Ziyech from Twente. Uh, yeah, I like him a lot, but I guess he's more of an attacking midfielder, isn't he? He is, he is, and at the level of play that he's shown over the course of the last few seasons, I don't see him moving to Milan, I see him moving to a title challenger somewhere, maybe in, well, in in England's kind of in flux at the moment, so nobody knows what's there, but... Perhaps yeah. to Spain, perhaps to Germany, but I don't see him moving not to Milan nor to Italy in general. 
For yeah. the attack, we got Lapadula, so... I yeah, cannot... I suppose we, we, we better address that, really. It's just yeah. come through um, just before we started recording that that's an official deal. Um, so, yeah, that that's a good one to wrap up because... I think it's one of those signings, and I've seen this on Twitter, I think it's one of those signings where if he'd have gone to someone else, if he'd have gone to Juve or he'd gone to Sassuolo, then the, obviously all Milanisti would have been complaining about another player that we allowed to get away. And it's nice um, to see for us to, to see a player uh, go and actually get him and sort of do it under the radar like the good old days. Um, and hopefully, if the, if the rumours are true about uh, this being a deal that was sanctioned by the Chinese, then, you know, it's it's staff and something exciting. Um, and he's a good player as well, though. I think, um, obviously, he scored, what was it, 23 league goals? 27, last season? 27 league goals, 30 all competitions, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you can't argue with that for a record. I mean, he pretty much single-handedly got them promoted. Um, so... He had 40% of Pescara's goals or something. It was in that area, or like a little bit less than half, which is a, an incredible achievement for one player. Mm-hmm. But what worries me is that he is 26 years old. With He is a top scorer, so he's shown that he can put the ball into the back of the net. But he, as a 26-year-old, has less than 150 professional appearances, whereas today you're seeing 21, 22-year-olds with that amount. So, yeah, he, yeah that, that that is a bit of a worry. He played um, a full. He played a full forty games with Pescara, which show that he can push out an entire season and push out an entire season of high quality performances. But the fact that he just does not have a huge amount of experience in general worries me, <laughs> and the fact that none of it was at. Essentially, top none of level. it was was in, uh, yes, top level, top flight, uh, club. Yeah. So I, I guess preseason will be actually a good indicator as to how quickly he will adjust. I know a lot of people don't take anything from preseason games, but you know we've got some pretty good opposition um, in the international Champions Cup, and I'd like to see him given a given a go. Um, I suppose there's a lot of talk about who will actually be his strike partner because it seems like every single striker is leaving us this summer. Um, I think Baka will probably end up going now. I think Niang, if the offer's right, I can see us selling him. Um, Menez will probably go to Monaco now. Uh, they've supposedly offered him a two-year deal with an option for a third year. Um, and then Luis Adriano, does anyone know about him? I, I, I don't know about whether he's going to stay or not, but um, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's one piece, and if it does work out and he does settle in, then it'll it'll look like a masterstroke because nine million euros in with this with the current market, you know, it's 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 not a lot of money for someone who was as sought after as he is. Um, and of course, he's he's a versatile player. Like he can he can play out wide if necessary, or he can he, he can play as a secondary striker. Or um, so yeah, it's 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 an exciting it's an exciting signing as long as this is the start of it, you know, and not not the end. My hope is that he is able to partner with Niang, and I think that if Niang does stay, and I think he will stay. That is definitely a partnership to watch in preseason and in the opening matches of the coming uh, Serie A campaign because mm-hmm. Lapadula, he can create for himself, but if he is partnered with a player like Niang who is dynamic, who can drop back, who can drop to the side, who can push defenders out of the way for him, essentially draw them out, if he is able to establish a good partnership with him, then they can both essentially provide for each other, yeah. and both of them will benefit in front of goal, not just Lapadula getting getting passes from Niang, but he will be able to set up Niang to score as well. And 
Yeah, it'd, it'd think, be nice to have a partnership where um, the two strikers feed off each other rather than what was such an obvious plan last year um, with Niang pretty much creating for Baka and that was it. Um, it, it gives us a something, especially if, if we were to sign another striker, to have three genuine options would be nice. Um, whereas last season I never really felt all that confident when, obviously when, Luis Adriano was starting, um, even though him and Baca did in the early season look like they had a bit of chemistry that teetered out, and you know Adriano ended up being not used that much, um, and then Balotelli and Baca just didn't really work either. Um, so yeah, if if it is to be a completely new front two, then we've just got to hope for the best that it clicks pretty quickly, really, um, and hope that they get support from goals elsewhere as well. Uh, so they're not, you know, relying on doing it all themselves. Yeah. Uh, well, I wouldn't rule out Luis Adriano just yet. Uh, he really was not used very well last season, and that led to a lot of fans kind of writing him off, saying that we wasted money on him for nothing because he had half a year left on his contract when we bought him. So what ended up happening is we shelled out I believe 8 million euros and we yeah. really did not need to get him that early so for 8 million euros is again not a huge investment especially for a striker so I don't think I think he has he has uh, some elements of a good striker in him and he can still prove somewhat useful i don't think that he's going to be our first choice by any means but he isn't a entirely he's not a complete right off yet basically. he's not he's not a waste of money i think is what i'm trying to say yeah he we haven't seen enough of him to really make that judgment call obviously if he's released or if he's sold for like two or three million Next week, yes, then he is objectively a waste of money because we spent 8 million euros for no reason to... Mm-hmm. Uh, we essentially lost, what, 5, five 6 million euros for no... for Just to employ someone through, for a just, season. Just threw it yeah. out, yeah. Yeah. But... But yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the talk of Ibra doesn't go away, does it? It's it's not happening, no. but we all want to keep thinking about it. Yeah. Um, the only way that it could feasibly happen um, would be if we were to get taken over in the next few days. Uh, it's all smoke and mirrors. I maybe I guess I'm I am a very pessimistic uh, fan, and I've been like that for a couple of years. But I I don't think there's any chance of a deal to take over the club happening uh it's all again it's all smoke and mirrors and i will not believe anything until i see confirmation on the official website because yeah. to me it is it's false hope it's it's nonsense it's drawing away from what we what fans really need to be focusing on yeah and I mean, no, I don't. I, I think it's a very small likelihood of happening. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I think that the sale will happen. I do think it will happen, but I don't think it will be in the, the quick and efficient time frame that everyone hopes it will be in, um, in which we would be able to get our Mercato properly kick-started um, with some serious cash investment. Um, I reckon that, well... What would be more likely is if this was to carry on into July um, and really make everyone sweat a bit as to whether it will happen. But I think Berlusconi's health has become um, a bit of an issue. Obviously, you don't wish ill upon anyone, um, even if you do want them to sell the club or not. Uh, I think people are very, very short-sighted and they forget what Berlusconi has done for the club. You know, he basically saved us um, in... 89 uh, from bankruptcy and has brought us all these trophies etc and yeah it's time for him to move on before he damages his legacy but um, you know this is his club and this is the team that he built he's invested 
over 30 years of his life into it. Um, and ultimately, it's understandable that he, he wants to ensure that the deal is right. Um, and it's also understandable that he, he wants to have a role still, even if it is as honorary president, and that's about it. You know, that'll be... I think he'd, he'd end up taking that, to be honest, um, just so he can still be around, you know, just so he can show his face at the games and, you know, he can still chat with his best mate, Galliani and stuff like that. Um, I think that's, so, that's very important. I'm sorry to, sorry to cut you off, but no, uh, people now, it's, it's more skewed towards the younger fans that they, they, they don't appreciate just how important Berlusconi has been, not just for Milan, but for... Uh, football in general since his takeover of the club and because he single-handedly created the greatest side ever seen on a football pitch yeah. uh, and that's you know 1989 1991 Milan um, that really would not have been possible without him the academy players that we put out like Maldini and the rest of them that really their development and their the stature that they now hold would not have been possible without him. The mm-hmm. deals for players like Alessandro Nesta, Inzaghi, the ref, um, and Van Basten, none of that would have been there without him. And yeah. I thank him for everything that he has done, and he is part of the uh, the fabric of the club, and as kicking him out would, like, following the sale would be unacceptable. Uh, I think that it's accepting some sort of honorary role or some sort of, I guess, small serving board position or something of that sort would be a very good way of transitioning the club to new management, which needs to happen, but also keeping a person who has been more important to this club than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. And um, it does really annoy me when you see some people on social media saying, you know, I wish he'd just F off and stuff like that, you know. Um, like you say, I think it is the, the younger generation of fans um, who perhaps haven't, or they don't understand yet the full picture. Um, uh, but we'll just have to see how, how the whole sale thing develops. Like you say, I, I'm still a little bit sceptical, but I do think in the end it, it will go through. Um, but I don't know if it'll go through in time to make, for in enough time, you know, for us to make um, serious progress going into next season. Um, Sorry, ne- I didn't get that. Next uh, season might might just be uh, a bit of a, or, or maybe even if we're in a in a half decent position come January and the takeover has gone through, that might be the time to throw a load of money at it. Um, but you never get good deals done in January generally. Uh, but we'll we'll just have to see what happens. It seems to be seems to have been slow progress since Berlusconi came out of hospital, which is understandable. Um, but I expect Sal um, Gal. I don't know his surname. It'd be like Sal Gal, something like that. Um, will present a formal offer to Berlusconi, and then it will be his final call at the end of the day. And um, I wouldn't be totally surprised at all if he said no. Um, but. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. Definitely, I, I I hope that the the deal with chi- with the Chinese investors is real. I just I cannot put my hope into that right now because I've been let down by the team recently. Well, not recently, but in over the course of the last few years, so many times that wishing for something that may not happen is not something that I can make myself do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and obviously we saw it with the with the whole B to Shaobol thing as well. I mean, that was just so mentally taxing for all the supporters, and I can understand why people have their concerns this time round. Um, but I don't know. There's nothing nothing set in stone at the moment. Just as it seems that something has has developed majorly. Um, there's there's always someone reporting the contrary. Uh, but I imagine um, come the end of this month. Going into going into July, we'll have a pretty good idea where things stand. Um, obviously, that is when on July the first, uh, supposedly the new manager is going to be announced, or that's what I've read at least, which which sounds remarkable given that 
you know, there, there isn't a name that has been widely reported as that man who's going to take over. Um, I, I, honestly, the managerial situation in itself is something that we could probably record an hour-long special on. Uh, but uh, there's so many different names being floated about. Um, I think that based on the candidates that have been linked with us, I would have been really happy with Pellegrini. Um, I don't know about you. My number one candidate has been, and it still is, Giuseppe Di Francesco, and that is because he is one of the only managers who adapts his team to his opponents every single week. Uh, mm -hmm. There are very few. Massimiliano Allegri is one of them, and it's something that he did with us that was overlooked. A little bit, yeah. I think. He's he, he's an exceptional manager and that a lot of the fans at Milan did not give him the credit that he was due. But yeah. you can see, uh, it's visible, the differences in the way that Sassuolo plays against Juventus, the way they play against Frosinone, uh, the way they play against Torino. It's all, it's all different. And the... The, the constant switching of which flank they're going to go down, if they're going to sit deep, if they're going to try to quickly press and then shut down after scoring. It's it's Every week it's a different game plan. And that's what, in a way, contributed to the fact that Sassuolo beat almost all of the big teams this season. They beat Juventus. They, yeah. beat, they uh, won against us. They believe they won against Napoli, Inter, Fiorentina, uh, Roma, where they at least yeah. got, got some sort of result. And getting that against all of those teams is, is, is an incredible achievement, and it's part of the reason that they finished sixth. But I think that out of all the managers in the league, I think Di Francesco does the most research on his opponents prior to the games, and that's part of the reason that a team with effectively no funding, with a small stadium, limited yeah. supply Resources, of, yeah. of high-quality players, still managed to finish and potentially qualify for Europe. Yeah, that, and he's done a really, really good job there. And um, he's helped with the development of, of some key players as well. Obviously, Sansone, it would be nice to think that if he came to us, he would bring Sansone. Um, Berardi is obviously the, the major one, but actually I thought he was a little bit disappointing last season. Um, but he's he's done really well to guide guide that team um, to sixth place. It, it would be a good appointment, but it, in all honesty, I'm sceptical as to whether he would actually accept the job. Um, I think that Gianpaolo is a is a um, it's it's a name that it strikes me as such a Mihailovic style appointment. You know, it's just again recruiting from a team who had a slightly above average season. Um, without any disrespect to Sampdoria, to Mihailovic, or to Empoli, it, it would just be that and. Um, whether you agreed with Mihailovic being sacked or not, and the majority didn't, um, the the general consensus was that we needed a big name to, to really turn things around without the investment, otherwise there was no point. Um, and, you know, we've, we've been linked with a couple of big names. Obviously, Pellegrini was, was one, and Emery for a, for a while. And that would have been really nice. Um, but... You know, it looks like we're going to end up getting one of Giampaolo or uh, maybe De Boer now has been mentioned as well. Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. No, I, yeah. I would prefer that De Boer did not, did not come. I just want to say something that I remember that I did not say before, which is part of the reason why I think that Di Francesco won't come, although he is still my first choice, is that they sold for Salchko to uh, Atletico for what I understand is 16 million euros up front and 2 million in, in uh, bonuses mm -hmm. of some sort. So with that 
investment coming in. The, there, I don't see a reason for DeFrancesco to leave when he can try to build up the team more with the funding that he has. Obviously, replacing Versalchko is going to be a massive, massive undertaking because he is one of the best fullbacks in the in the in the league. And Sassuolo has not shown a lot of willingness to sign foreign players or players from outside Serie A. So yeah. replacing him is definitely going to be a challenge. But I think it's one that Di Francesco relishes, and it's really going to keep him with the club. Uh, Giampaolo, I think, would be a a decent managerial signing. And I don't think we're going to get much better because very few managers want to take the risk. Now it's a risk. Before it was an yeah. honor to uh, manage Milan, and now you're essentially taking a risk that's going to show up as a blemish on your on your record that you got sacked because you couldn't make anything out of a less than stellar team. Yeah. So yeah. Big, big names that five, ten years ago would have loved the opportunity to come coach us now have no desire to be anywhere near us. And that is a, a testament to how far and how quickly we've fallen and it's something that should spur the team on to do better because while having lesser known managers do great things is obviously very good being able to attract the best of the best is something that the club definitely needs to learn how to do again yeah and um and it's not just as simple as, as saying like we need a we need a big manager we need a manager with European experience etc to come in and manage us because like you say we're not that attractive a prospect anymore um, and yeah exactly like you said it, it shows how quickly we've fallen um, and it shows as well that the politics within the club probably isn't helping um, I think the only way that we would be able be able to attract a big manager is first of all if we could pay him like supposedly the issue with Pellegrini was that we we weren't offering him the the yearly salary that he wanted and also we've got to convince him that we've got a project and that there is going to be the investment to back that project otherwise yeah we might as well stick to targeting managers like again no disrespect but sticking to managing uh, managers such as Giampaolo who you get the feeling that eventually one of those is going to click, you know, and um, he might just be onto something. Uh, obviously, if you bring Saponada, then that's another big thing. Uh, but, yeah, I think the, the managerial situation is as unclear as everything else at the club. Yeah. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. I think the conclusion of the Euros is definitely going to have more moves being made uh, because now players, managers, uh, owners of clubs are more concerned with seeing how players perform at the tournament. And so Mm -hmm. after that concludes, we'll most likely be seeing uh, a little bit more activity from Milan, hopefully. Uh, But there's nothing for us to do but but wait and hope and that, speculate and that our thoughts our desires as as a community of fans are taken into account yep um so yeah it's all a waiting game at the moment obviously with the sale with the uh with the uh man- Material situation with any signings, etc. Um, and hopefully, when we come back next week, there might, might even be a bit more clarity on some of these things. But you never know with Milan beer. Yeah, you really don't. So I, th- I think that just about wraps it up for this week's episode. Um, thank you very much to Daniel uh, for sharing his thoughts and uh, being a very good host. I must add. Um, and uh, yeah, we might have a guest on next week, but uh, more about that to be announced. So stay tuned um, 
on our Twitter channel and on Facebook. Um, you'll find the links in the description if you're listening on YouTube. Um, and in addition to that, we just want to plug one more time that we uh, currently have a giveaway on for a free Italy shirt for the European Championships. Um, all you have to do is uh, retweet the tweet, which will be again in the description, and uh, follow us on Twitter to be entered, and we will be announcing the winner at 1,000 followers on Twitter. So that's an exciting opportunity to get yourself uh, a free Italy shirt. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for listening. Uh, goodbye from me, and thank you for listening, everyone. Ciao. il tiro fermato. Forever Young Niang, impazzisco! Forever Young Niang, impazzisco! Forever Young Niang, impazzisco! Forever Young Niang, impazziamo! 3 a 0!